Is this on? Hello? Yeah. Okay. Should we get started? Welcome. So welcome back to day two of um, Living a Digital Life. My name is Megan Sapner Ankerson. I'm going to be moderating this panel. Um, I am an associate faculty in communication studies, um, and my background is in media studies, interaction design, um, and web history. Uh, so this topic of speculation and memory is something that's uh, particularly of interest to me because I've studied a lot of the, the dot-com bubble, and that was a period of tremendous excitement around speculation um, and design. And so I've thought a lot about this from the perspective of uh, thinking about speculation as a visual phenomenon. The term speculation is uh, typically associated with buying and selling stocks or a rise and fall in their market value. It comes from the Latin verb, I uh, can't pronounce it, specer, meaning to look or see. And so speculation is bound up with visuality in the faculty of sight. So it calls up these images of investing, lavish uh, displays of excess, spectacular appeals to the eye. Um, and the etymology of the term also refers to a deeper kind of seeing that entails profound reflection on the world or a contemplation that invites um, a hypothetical view of the future. Um, so, uh, and similarly with memory, uh, this is a term I think uh, Plato famously was concerned that writing would uh, destroy memory. And so from a media studies perspective, the links between memory and materiality and inscription has been something that has been you know, theorized and thought a lot about. So say something with like photography, when you look at a photograph, are you remembering, in, in terms of memory, are, do you remember later the memory or are you remembering the photograph? How are um, how is our memory bound up with our media experiences, with our experiences with communication technologies, and how does digital media and digital technologies transform these relationships around um, memory, around time, around the past and the future? Is speculation about imagining the future, and is memory about remembering the past? Um, why is memory the past and speculation the future? Um, how do digital technologies um, transform the way that we think about the past and the future? So even things like working with um, my background in working with web archives, for example, are different types of artifacts that are created by a web archive. is something that's created by robots. It's something that's an automated assembly process. It doesn't work the way that we're used to thinking about archives in terms of paper archives or even like photographic media. So when we have these new technologies and these new experiences, what new possibilities do they invite? And I'm very happy today to have um, three panelists who will reflect on this with their own work. Um, we have, uh, I will introduce each of them, uh, Osman Khan, Tiffany Funk, and Meg Lated Jones. So um, Osman Khan is uh, an artist who's interested in constructing artifacts and experiences for social criticism and aesthetic expression. So his work plays and subverts the materiality behind themes of identity and communication, economics, public space, uh, through participatory and per performative installations and site-specific inventions. So he received his Bachelor's of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Columbia University and an MFA at UCLA's Department of Design Media Arts. Um, and now he is faculty here at the University of Michigan, where we're very ha ha happy to have him at the School of Art and Design, where he's teaching focuses on computational and kinetic media. And so his work has been shown at a number of venues in um, Shanghai Biennial in China, Zero One Festival, San Jose, um, the LA Louvre in uh, LA, Wit de Wit, Center for Contemporary Art, Rotterdam, uh, in uh, Socrates Sculpture Park in New York City, SIGGRAPH San Diego, Bank LA, um, and he is a recipient of Art Matters Grant Ars Electronic, uh, Electronica's Pre-Art Award of Distinction and the Arctic Circle 2009 Residency. Um, Tiffany Funk is a PhD, uh, has a PhD and is an artist and critical theorist who researches and specializes in topics of emerging media, computer art, um, video games, performance art practices, and she received a BA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, an, an MA at the University of Chicago, an MFA in new, new Media Arts from the University of Illinois at Chicago, where she also received her PhD in art history. 
Um, and she is a co-founding lecturer and academic advisor of IDEAS, which stands for Interdisciplinary Education in the Arts, um, and in, which is an intermedia theory and practice based, based Bachelor of Arts degree at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And Tiffany is also the editor in chief of the Video Game Art Reader, which is a peer reviewed journal for video game audiences and video game practitioners interested in the history, theory, and criticism of video games explored through the lens of art, history, and visual culture. Um, Meg Leda Jones is an associate professor in the Communication, Culture, and Technology Department at Georgetown University, where she researches rules and technological change, focusing on privacy, data protection, and automation in digital information and computing technologies. She is a core faculty of the Science, Technology, and International Affairs program at Georgetown's School of Foreign Service and an affiliate at the Center for Privacy and Technology at Georgetown Law Center. And she's a visiting faculty at the Brussels Privacy Hub. I cannot pronounce Vrish. How do you say that? V? Okay. <laughs> um, in Brussels. Uh, she researches comparative information communication technology law, critical information data studies, governance of emerging technologies, and the legal history of technology. So she engages with interdisciplinary fields like cyber law, um, uh, science technology studies, using comparative, interpretive, legal, and historical methods. So her book from, I think, 2016, is that right? Um, great book, Control Z, The Right to be Forgotten, um, is about the social, legal, and technical issues surrounding digital oblivion. Um, uh, her next project she's working on is the transatlantic construction of digital consent since the mid-20th century through the lens of cookies, which sounds very fascinating. These are not cookies that one eats, by the way. This is a, a browser cookie. Um, uh, okay, uh, and finally, you, uh, Dr. Jones earned a PhD in technology, media, and society from the University of Colorado, engineering and applied science. And prior to pursuing a PhD, she earned a JD from the University of Illinois College of Law in 2008, where she focused on technology and information issues. Um, let's see, since 2013, she's been teaching and researching in Washington, D.C. at Georgetown University, which is one of my alma maters. We're very happy to have you here. Thank you for coming. Um, I think on that, I will turn it over to um, Osman. Are, are you going to start us off? Is that, who's first? Okay, is that good? Okay, well, thank you, and uh, please join me in welcoming Osman Khan. Let's see how it looks. So uh, thank you, uh, thank you. I want to just start by thanking all the, uh, I think this is the mic, right? Uh, thanking all the organizers for putting uh, the, the symposium together and inviting me. I want to thank Megan for uh, moderating our little instantiation of digital life this morning and everyone uh, for being here, good morning. So I thought I'd uh, sort of share <clears throat> six works that are that sort of deal with this topic. Uh, I'll break them into sort of three sets of two. Uh, the works were originally you know, created not with this sort of lens in mind, but I'll sort of think through it and kind of use these other synonymous and adjunct terms as a way of kind of thinking through it. So not just memory and speculation, but notions like past, future, traditional, radical, old or new, collective, personal, nostalgia, curiosity. But of course, the reality is these are not things that <clears throat> the, the, you know, these are not terms that allude to ultimately more about the other, some exterior, exteriorness, but rather the contemporary and the now. So even if we think about history, it's actually really telling us about today. The other thing, of course, is as all people who make all artwork is a speculation, and then very quickly, as it collects dust in our studios, becomes memory. So I'd like to start off with uh, two works made in, within one year of each other. This is 2003, 2004, that explores two mediums, 
one waning, the other crescending. The first perhaps can be seen as a last rite, for that of the, the kind of um, the TV condition, that TV condition that the Buggles sang about, that killed the radio star, that TV condition, that passive, not streaming, but beaming CRT tube wonder. The other is uh, exploring the medium that has served our attentions, the internet. So we interrupt your regularly scheduled program revisits the condition of the television and a relationship to it. The installation wished to investigate the very nature of television, interrogating the broadcast through a reinterpretation of its perpetual flow, something more akin to a geologist looking at landscape than an anthropologist examining visual culture. Start the video. So a television is placed and it's sort of, you can see it here, I think, uh, is, is placed facing the wall, its flickering glow reflecting off the wall, and its sound echoes in the space. Its broadcast signal is simultaneously sent to a computer where a customized software processes the broadcast and in real time sent, uh, uh, projects it back uh, by collapsing every frame of the television into kind of a one pixel slice. So rather than TV coming at you this way, every frame is sort of collapsed in an average pixel slice and then sort of stacked horizontally. So what we're seeing is both a kind of timeline of you know, about a minute worth of TV as well as um, kind of a, a different interpretation or different language that comes out. Um, so what, what sort of kind of comes out of it is uh, the sort of abstracted history of the broadcast signal. Cinematic cuts are transformed into clear vertical sections uh, camera pans and zooms become visualized as curves. Commercials and music videos are seen as vibrant vertical patterns and hectic splashes of color, while news programs are stoic studies of horizontal smears. Let me just sort of move forward so you can sort of understand how that actually looks. Um, visitors are encouraged to switch channels with the remote and explore the relationship between the broadcast, its sound, and the projection. In disconnecting the sound with the expected visuals and replacing it with abstract projection, the work oscillates the visitor's focus, where the sound emitting from the television points to its sometimes triviality, and projection exposes the seductive nature of its inherent images. The juxtaposition reveals the nature of television at once both mesmerizing and banal. So it's not actually used as a kind of an analytical tool, but it sort of exposes it and sort of looks at it almost in geological terms, where strata is kind of understood where edits and, 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 and camera movements are kind of read in a very different way. So the next work uh, called Net Worth uh, explored the rising condition, this was again created in 2004, where information is given more prominence than the corporeal. Monetary systems of the world are already understood as really vast accounting systems where money's exchange is actually data transferred. As such, entrance to the work, the card swipe, as you can sort of see there, uh, echoes a familiar interaction with obvious financial overtones. However, the so social condition of the swipe is subverted as a means to exploring another notion, that of information as body, or more accurately, body as information. Already ID cards, credit cards, and, and the like are already deemed more proof of person than the actual physical body. Add to this the existence of the internet and the action of Googling entering our everyday language New relations between the corporeal and virtual are now being created, and new structures of social strata and value have emerged. The visitor is presented with a kiosk with a magnetic card reader that stands in front of a monolith-like structure. A projected image with people's names at various heights. Oops, I just want to pause that. A uh, projected image with people's names at various heights on the color field is projected onto that monolith. The visitor is encouraged to swipe their magnetic, their credit card or ATM card. Then the visitor's name from that, that is contained on the magnetic stripe of their card is parsed and Googled. The positioning or ranking of their name appears vertically on the monolith projection, which represents the number of hits returned by a Google search uh, on that individual's name. Then their name appears on the proje projection among other visitors who have swiped as well. Some higher net worth individuals, celebrities, politicians, and other famous figures were prefed into the system, not only as a litmus test for the visitor, but also reflections on our social condition. Who has more Google hits, Paris Hilton or William Shakespeare? Thus the visitor can view their new net worth in respect to others. 
As the internet has become the primary aggregator, disseminator, and communicator of information, we increasingly give dominance to information over materiality. And new forms of power and value structures have emerged. Individuals with greater net presence read more hits, are deemed more significant than those with little or none, and they become inconsequential. So net worth was exploring this new value system for this sort of information-dependent society. So, just wanted to... So here we see someone swiping. He gets sort of a lower hit. And then I'm going to just sort of zoom. So this is an actor from Office Space, if anyone's seen that show, uh, TV show. So on an experiential level, Net Worth also examines individuals' narcissism, narcissism and hubris. Much like the carnival hammer hit game, where physical muscle is tested, net worth gives chance for visitors to flex their data bodies. How do you rank against the Joneses, against your best friend, or against your favorite theorist? So, sort of the next section. So I'll look at two works of, uh, that look at kind of two sides of kind of the built, the urban built. The first, an alternate response to the ruined porn that became synonymous uh, with Detroit before the bankruptcy, a, a lens that situated the landscape as a new sublime, the other an attempt to reimagine the folly for the 21st century. The installation Come, or, uh, Come Hell or High Water explores the domestic uncanny as an aesthetic performance, where the physical damages to the house reveal the larger social and psychological anxiety of our contemporary condition. An eight by six by six foot less vitrine, more Petri dish, initially showcased a section of a living room, a proxy for the whole house, a simulacrum of a typical middle American house, the color of the room and carpet, and uh, furniture was based on best-selling paints and carpets from Home Depot and Ikea, also shopping from Craigslist and local thrift stores. The room is flooded and drained periodically for the duration of the exhibition. The flooding, the timing, and amount is determined through a heuristic algorithm that takes into account global tidal patterns, regional meteorological forecasts, and CO2 levels in the exhibition space. The effect of the simulated deluge is allowed to wreak havoc into the room. It's entropic performance on display for all to see. So this is a sort of flooding. Funny enough, the Titanic actually sank perfectly, as it was supposed to. <laughs> um, the work with allusions to Hans Hacke's con condensation cube performs not only to its own hermetic condition, but talks to a larger concern of global warming, if read literally, or other perceived or unknown impending disasters, a more metaphoric take that disrupts and destroys the safety and sanctity of the domestic condition, especially within the context of the American dream. The title of the work, Come or, Hi Hell or High Water, is plastered in gold foil letters on the underside of a table you can sort of see there, sporadically exposing itself, bobbing up every now and then in the water during the period of the exhibition. This can be read beyond its intended pun in either two ways, cynically as a pathetic gusto now drowned in its own hubris, or as a heroic prophecy, even with the room destroyed, memories washed away, the house fallen, or the imperishable desire for home. The reality of this condition is that we are left not with an encounter with the sublime or even the uncanny, but rather the abject. The work points not to memorials, to grand narratives, but the realities and the grotesqueness of lost homes and forgotten people. <clears throat> the next piece is uh, kind of the folly. So with equal law, uh, called when laughter trips at the threshold of the divine, when, with equal nods to minimalism's aesthetic and consumerism's supermarket maximalism, the project places a fully functional automatic door in the middle of a public park here, Socrates Sculpture Park, offering the everyday as folly for play, re-experience, re and reflection on neutered thresholds. It's amazing that a two-year-old knows ex that the door will open and should open. The other interesting fact is right next to the park is a Costco with 14 of these, and yet people still desired 
to walk through. Uh, and lastly, kind of the, the kind of probably the real folly is the disappointment of going through this, this threshold, as you don't actually go from one space to another but the same, and how, how <laughs> un unfulfilling that experience was. The last two works explore mediation uh, or interventions of speculative objects into public and private narratives with the impossible task of shifting the masses into communities. The first work, seen for the, our labor reinvigorates a public plaza through an alternative form of communication between its citizenry. Commissioned by the 01 San Jose Festival and installed uh, in front of the San Jose Museum of Art uh, facing Cesar Chavez Park, the monolith as a communicative device is reminiscent of the ubiquitous stelas, obelisks, plaques, and sculptures that populate public squares, or used to at least populate public squares. These traditional monuments carry messages and sanctify historical moments and sets of values upon which the city has been built, typically initiated or enforced by the power structures in place. Think Code of Hammurabi's stela. Scene upturns the power dynamics and looks to broadcast a variety of unshared principles from the, the mouths of everyday citizens. These deal with the projected hopes and, and the American dream in light of globalization. The project uh, asks members of three communities that make up San Jose's labor needs. Silicon Valley's tech workers, undocumented service workers, and outsourced, outsourced coal workers from India. The same question, what is the fruit of your labor? The responses are displayed back onto the general public on the four by eight infrared LED screen. So kind of the magical condition or the slippage of uh, infrared LEDs is are the naked eye can't see it. It is in invisible light. But the slippage is the digital eye, the CCD kind of sensor, actually can see that spectrum. So, uh, so this content is only visible through the audience personal digital capture device. In this case, either cell phones, digital cameras, DV cams, and the like. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm going to just move forward to the time. This is sort of the installation. So, the, so there's the kind of the infrared LEDs that are embedded. Um, sort of there's the San Jose condition um, we were looking at kind of behind the scenes <laughs> uh, construction, and ultimately sort of how it was viewed. And as you can tell from the cameras, this is pre-Instagram, pre-smartphone, people still had flip phone. In fact, there were enough people out there that didn't even have cameras that had phones, so there was a kind of jockeying or kind of over the shoulder looking to, to actually see what people were looking at. The traditional role of the public plaza as the device through which citizens and institutions communicate to one another has long been superseded by mass communication. Oops, I'm almost, I am out of time, but let me just run through this quickly. Um, what McLuhan called the electronic agora. Uh, Seen looked at the potential confluence of these two divergent technologies to reanimate, reanimate public space. The project resulted in a fiber, vibrant interaction between people sharing their viewing devices with total straight strangers, discussing the streaming messages, and telematically sharing their viewed experience with others in their phone book. It also brought voice, especially the badly stigmatized undocumented workers, into the public arena and showed their aspirations to be no different than others. So I'm going to just conclude with the last piece, which is actually a work in progress, but has already had some iterations and is part of a larger body of work uh, called a thousand and, or 1001 nights uh, with iterative sort of plus plus uh, magical technologies. It's a series of artworks inspired by Arthur C. Clarke's third law. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. This lens allows us to re-examine folk narratives not as superstition, superstitious and fanciful but to read the magic as culturally aspirational desires of applied technology. Particularly the work looks at uh, this, this as a method of decolonizing knowledge uh, and, and describing sort of pre-colonial concerns and dreamings. Uh, 1001 Nights harnesses emerging technologies to realize and reimagine the magic 
inherent and underrepresented and under-researched folk tales and lore from the Middle East, South, South Asian, and other immigrant communities. The project revisits this magic from these immigrant cultures in order to provide alternate narratives that counter the prevalent and hegemonic logic of most current techno-culture, aka Silicon Valley white bro culture, which kind of sees its manifestation in, in something like Alexa, right, uh, who is an assistant um, with a female voice, no, no doubt. Uh, the project uses and refers to technologies such as drones, learning algorithms, Bitcoin and immersive VR to bring lost narratives to a larger audience, offering rich alternative impressions of these cultures. Also using these technologies in an alternate and positive way. Though typically these communities have a strained relationship to said technologies, think of drone bombings, digital surveillance, the project provides its own diasporic communities with a reinvigorated new telling of their own lore through a futurist lens offering new imaginaries and kind of works in progress are flying carpets realized with drone technologies, the, the mystical wing Barack reimagined as a VR film, Alibaba as a crypto hacker, and, and the like. Um, the particular project I do want to just very quickly go through is uh, Sherazad 2.0. Um, so uh, Sherazad, if people don't know is the sort of protagonist of A Thousand and One Nights. She's, uh, uh, in order to save her own life, tells a new story every night to the king who, who is so enthralled by her stories, kind of keeps her life alive for A Thousand and One Nights uh, uh, and eventually falling in love with her. Sherazad 2.0 plays homage to its namesake and is an AI storyteller. The machine learning algorithm behind the system is trained not only on traditional folk and fairy tales from South Asia and the Middle East, but also uses contemporary crowdsourced narratives from local immigrant communities, weaving myths of yesterday with the heroes of today, generating infinitely new narratives for tomorrow. It also revisits an era of oral traditions, which is sort of funny. We are going back to with emo emoticons and emojis and kind of this oral to kind of these previous traditions in language. But the, the, in particular, that of the Dasangoi, the Urdu and Farsi tradition of storytelling, where the center is the Dasango or the storyteller, and whose voice is the main artistic tool in orally recreating the dastan, or story. So it kind of, it, it, it becomes a sort of bigger system where stories are generated and sent to the cloud and then sent to alternate storytellers. Uh, two instances have been already developed. This one was recently put at UFM Shapiro Library, and this one was placed at the Detroit Public Library. And that's it. Thank you for letting me go a little over, probably a lot over. And that was my story for the day. Thank you. Gen dongle. Dongles, dongles. <laughs> Who's got the dongle? Is that? Indeed, we got it. So, all right. And the fringus. Just there. There, I got it. And the. Mm -hmm. Blue. Or do I have to do a, hmm. oh, oh, we got it, okay, let's just, uh -huh. green slideshow. Uh huh, you're seeing what I'm seeing. Hello, thank you for inviting me to all the organizers. This is great. Um, I'm very sorry that I'm gonna start out with a joke. <laughs> Um, I mean, first there's the joke here, the JavaScript joke, get it, or, and then the and. I, I know, it's not, it's not very funny. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, to 
give my interpretation of the memory speculation. Um, with memory as an art historian, I think through history, of course, like an embedded history, media art histories, media archaeology. So I'm going to go into sort of an art history. Um, and then speculation, I like to think of it in terms of pedagogy, because who are those of us that are we going forward and telling these stories, basically? Um, and as um, a um, as a member of the VGA Art Gallery, the editor-in-chief of our journal, as well as uh, the co-founder of this new program at the University of Illinois at Chicago, the Interdisciplinary Education of the Arts program, um, we really are trying to think of new ways in order to present a, a new kind of digital literacy. Um, and VGA Gallery now has a new education arm in which we try to reach out to local high school students especially, trying to think through how to talk about video games and digital art making to a new community of makers um, that are coming from a different cultural and social context than what, say, all of us have come from, which, I mean, even if we are, you know, quote unquote, digital natives, which I really hate that phrase, um, that digital native means a different thing to different people depending on what sort of technologies they've had contact with. So because in Chicago I surround myself with a lot of hacker types and especially we're the dirty new media glitch art sort of capital self-proclaimed maybe, um, I added the um, the dedication in the beginning of the uh, glitch reader when we had our first glitch fest in 2011. Um, so kind of thinking about this memory of those who have come before us in the hacker era. Um, so here's the, the dreaded joke. Um, so stop me if you've heard this one. A mechanical engineer, a chemical engineer, and a computer scientist are driving down the street. The car breaks down and all three get out to see what's wrong. The mechanical engineer says, I know what's wrong. It sounds like the piston rods are misaligned. If we just fix it, it'll work again. She takes out her tools, starts messing with the engine. 30 minutes later, the car still is not running. The chemical engineer says, no, no, it sounds like we're having a problem with the oxygen mixture. It's too rich, and we just need to tune that. So she pulls out the oxygen sensor and starts tweaking, but 30 minutes later, this car still doesn't go. The computer scientist says, I know what you two are talking about. Now, just turn the car off slam the left passenger door three times, walk around the car twice, turn it back on, and it will work again. They do that, and lo and behold, the car starts. In his um, 2014 article in defense of command line bullshittery, computer scientist Aitna Adair retells this popular computer science joke as a rebuttal to an article by his colleague, Philip Guao, entitled Helping My Students Overcome Command Line Bullshittery, in which Guao decries the Byzantine methods computer scientists employ to wrestle with these obscure command line prompts. Guao took his discipline to task by asking whether computer science is fundamentally built upon an adeptness for, go for Googling to figure out these problems and not an adeptness at actual programming. Though Adair's opposed position that students need to learn these methods for real life on the job experience is pragmatic, it's at best short sighted and at worst exclusionary and elitist. It continues a long tradition of cultishness in programming where software engineers are regarded as techno shamans. Um, this computer priesthood is famously criticized in Ted Nelson's Computer Lib, You Can and Must Understand Computers Now, but little has seemed to change since he self-published this text back in 1974. Um, I added the, uh, the Chicago New Media 1973 to 1992 exhibition catalog that we helped um, co-produce on the University of Illinois of Chicago uh, campus through VGA. Um, because we included Ted Nelson, because during this time he was actually at UIC um, it, within the computer science department, working with a lot of our computer scientists there in the electronic visualization lab. Um, also, uh, there is this, um, case in point, there's a recent interview featured in Vice's motherboard website, profiled a reverend and a witch, whose job it was to cast spells that com combat computer virus viruses. So um, she has these candles and these incense that she burns and always turns the computer off and on again. 
Um, and this is also an Instagram post by a friend of mine, uh, Chris Collins. He is um, a developer, and software developer, and uh, game designer. Um, and this was about the Uber Lyft strike, basically talking about algorithms as magic and this, this persistent myth that we have to deal with. So although recent game making tools have made some progress in creating an environment of accessibility for students, uh, processing, p5.js, Twine, Game Maker Studio, influx of Unity and game modding tutorials on, on YouTube, especially, lynda.com, Cadenza, etc. Few art historians, curators, and critics have had any of their own tools to approach the labor of digital design, impeding effective critique and historical contextualization. In addition, students avoid approaching digital processes as they do traditional media. Um, Proprietary software does not reward trial and error, getting dirty, breaking rules, and many industry-focused game design programs in higher education do little to expel misapprehensions and cultural biases we often hold about pro programming and gaming culture. Um, as an art historian specializing in computer history, data ethics, digi digital literacy, etc., I find it crucial that instructors employ an evolving strategy to teach um, students how to effectively analyze digital media with an eye towards addressing the, how we form historical memory and in turn shape our digitally entwined futures. This also goes towards the way in which we um, approach curational aspects of VGA gallery. So I've summed up um, some of my pedagogical strategies for teaching digital media and video games into five really messy intertwining proposals. Um, focusing on performative historical narrative connecting the seemingly disparate paradigms of early computation, 20th century conceptual art practices, and video games. And my hope is that this approach establishes an inclusive collaborative space for critical experimentation, calls out inequities built into the usage of proprietary devices and media, and contends with the jargon-laden obfuscation of command line bullshittery, encouraging hands-on, radical, DIY methods restoring agency to the artists and designers. By emphasizing these often forgotten historical examples, celebrating programming, engineering, adapting, and even breaking technology to radical ends, um, a greater awareness of these issues promotes a new radical digital literacy. So I have five brief proposals for teaching digital art practices, presenting, presenting digital art. Um, so the first is, the hardware platform and software application are a mutually beneficial system, and bo in, both in function and conception. In light of certain high-profile video game exhibitions in recent memory, most notably the Museum of Modern Art's video game displays and its applied design gallery, it is apparent that understanding the relationship between software and hardware or platform and game is often ignored. So, for example, um, Tarn and Zach Andrews Dwarf Fortress, uh, the 2006 ASCII roguelike game with generative maps was acquired by MoMA and was originally programmed in BASIC. It was converted to C, and its development and play speaks to an embedded history and connection to the medium of PC programming and gaming. Um, by the way, I don't know if you guys are Dwarf Fortress fans, but it's coming out on Steam basically because um, the tar uh, Tarn and Zach Andrews need healthcare. So buy the game, play it. It's fun and overwhelming. Um, but they owe this ASCII aspect, the ASCII aesthetic, speaks to this history of both roguelike text-based gaming, you know, for example, like Zork, Colossal Cave Adventure, as well as tabletop storytelling practices of Dungeons and Dragons, etc. Um, it also reflects a longer history of early computer art, recalling works by Vujkosic, um, pioneering net artist whose ASCII works abstracted film and media images. For example, he ASCIFied uh, Deep Throat. That's what this is. He also did The Birds, many other um, uh, popular films. Um, so, however, by placing hardware under glass, as one would a modernist artifact, the object is not only uh, non-functional, but is also robbed of accessibility to its contextual and historical meaningfulness. And likewise, displaying software through emulators, though a necessary way to preserve and document programs, should be understood as what it is. It's a remake, that it's documentation. So Pac-Man, um, when uh, stripped from its cabinet, loses touch with the historical and aesthetic importance of its unique style of gameplay, 
that fundamentally influence the social development of arcade culture. So number two, the um, programming constitutes physical labor, a performance between programmer, designer, and her software hardware. So I could have also presented this in the labor uh, 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 panel as well. I, I um, emphasize labor a lot when I talk to my students about digital uh, literacy. So without an understanding of the labor of programming, um, we undervalue the work of the programmers, engineers, and designers who create digital art and games. It's only recently that the plight of game designers at AAA gaming companies working 80 plus hour work weeks have made news. Um, but it's often argued that working on games is this quote unquote labor of love and the price designers pay for working at their dream job. Um, what's more crowdsourced and user generated content are also great sources of income for all levels of the game industry. In addition, there remains much to be done to sort through the ecologically dangerous practices of the software industry. Mammoth server farms, data centers come at an environmental cost, uh, consuming massive amounts of energy, and unethical labor practices continue to entrench race, gender, et cetera, biases in recruiting, promoting, retaining employees. I also just wanted to show this, the materiality of, of computing. This is the cooling, central cooling plant in, in Douglas County, Georgia for Google. Um, so these places, if any of you have watched Silicon Valley, you know exactly what I'm talking about in terms of these server farms. Everybody should be watching Silicon Valley. If you're not watching Silicon Valley, you're, you're missing out. Um, so number three and four, programming can be play and solo and cooperative play can exist in the same space inside and beyond the classroom. Um, though programming is labor, uh, there's no clean line between labor and play. And this is especially evident in our contemporary landscape of labor gamifying apps. However, art historians know that this is not a new phenomenon. Um, fluxus performances in the 1960s and 70s famously blurred the line through exploring processes uh, and they often refer to the community practices as a laboratory. Uh, similarly, the labor of programming and play is embedded in the history of computational art. Uh, Roy Ascot, foundational uh, telematics and uh, artist and a theorist, he famously um, emphasized software, um, the programmed con instructions encoded to be understood by the computer and executed as a behavior um, in his 1970s software as art manifestos. So when art is a form of behavior, software predominates over hardware in the creative sphere and process replace product and importance just as systems supersede structure. Consider the art object in its total process a behaviorable in its history, a futurable in its structure, a trigger in its effect. The behaviors that he engendered in his own work was often a kind of gaming. Um, Ascot's 1983 pioneering telematic performance, La Plaisir du Texte, the pleading of the text, is an interesting illustration of this concept. So in the act of distributed authorship, Ascot collaborated with 14 nodes across the world, including Paris, Pittsburgh, Vienna, Amsterdam, to create this collaborative fairy tale. Uh, to each node, Ascot assigned a role of a traditional character princess, witch, fairy godmother, prince, etc., um, that each node would characterize through their online interactions. Beginning with Once Upon a Time, Ascot found that over the course of 24 hours a day for 12 days, due to differences between time zones and improvisation, the game-like performative narrative fragmented and abstracted in the style of an exquisite corpse, um, unfolding online through both text as well as ASCII pictures and symbols that they sent back and forth. Most surprisingly, however, was that although every location should have had an identical copy of the complete text, all versions differed in small ways. Um, thus, there was no definitive version. Um, as demonstrated by Ascot's performance in proto video game, Plusier, software should be understood as this process-based unfolding in time and thus fundamentally performative and unique. It was cooperatively played and programmed. However, this conception of software has been overshadowed by much of the software industry. And open source development, though in existence for decades, still con constitutes what many consider a radical alternative to proprietary software production. And as Guo and Adair observe, these models often lack the polish of proprietary software and can become mired in this aforementioned command line bullshittery. 
And this is where pedagogical practice, uh, rather than easy workarounds, becomes key. Um, as Guao explains, he says, as an advisor, I found that one of the highest level activities that I do with my students is guiding them through the intricacies of command line bullshittery. There is simply no substitute for sitting down with them one on one on their laptop and walking them through all of the arcane commands to type, what they each mean, and how to interpret the bullshit output that's barfed out of the drab terminal. In addition to this bullshittery, creative coding instructors find that a certain amount of learned helplessness and anxiety often plagues students new to programming, which necessitates cooperative learning methods. Um, students should learn from instructors, but also from one another and, through discussion and group work. In fact, collaborative practices should be considered crucial today's economic climate. A number of artists and activists have taken the approach of hybrid theory practice methods, emphasizing collaborative approaches to survival. The growing movement of alternative economies, economic networks based on collaborative, socially oriented model, one, function independently of the dominant neoliberalist capitalist model, and two, they reorient the concept of transaction to multiple ways in which exchange can be negotiated, replacing formal market trans trans transactions with alternative markets where considerations other than supply and demand influence the terms of exchange. And three, they provide physical spaces of exchange education, collaboration, and safety, of which we think VGA Gallery is one. As artists, activists are increasingly enmeshed in social practice methods that include the development of digital biosovereignty networks, for example, alternative economic strategies provide fuel and safety for marginalized bodies that benefit most from these collaborative environments. Um, last but not least, number five, software needs to be treated like any artistic medium uh, data has embedded meaning and significance. Um, careful consideration uh, needs to be made of technology and its historical, social, and cultural influence. More now than ever, data, whether an accumulation of world temperatures from the past or present, or the rising numbers of incarcerated individuals in the U.S. prison system, needs to be translated and interpreted to gain a semblance of context. And though the explosion of user-friendly game development software has increased accessibility to game design but, um, beyond software engineers, these tools also come with a fair share of limitations that could be disheartening to students used to the open worlds of that expected 30 plus hours of gameplay. Um, game design software fundamentally influences our interactions with this and, and thus influence outcomes. Um, for example, digital artist Daniel Souter's phrase, implied aesthetics, can apply to design placing limitations on the kinds of interactions one has with personal technologies. It describes how aesthetic choices that are made for us by the software deeply influence the end result. Though these restrictions can seem creatively limiting, as such as images using the same Photoshop filter, um, when limitations, limitations are approached critically, they can create some amazing opportunities. Um, Twine, for example, is um, a game design software that I often teach to beginning game developers. And it is very restrictive because it often leads to these text-based um, games. And it can seem limiting. However, these limitations can actually bring about some really great innovation. Uh, one of the, the greatest examples of this that I always bring up is um, Anna Anthropy's Twine game, Queers in Love at the End of the World. And it uses the restrictions of hypertext-based gaming with a 10-second timer to create this poetic, collapsing, apocalyptic world. And it emphasizes this transcendence of queer love. So these proposals, though super brief, some half-baked, and are meant to spark conversations engaging the connections between technological, materiality, performance, and game design, and this longer history of digital and conceptual art practices. Exploring the history of art practices through material physical functioning of these technologies, especially through the history of artworks that experiment with these digital tools, allows a unique opportunity to interrogate the history and context of the computer as a radical yet embattled artistic tool, so often used without the proper reflection. Um, and ultimately, we must help our students understand a rapidly evolving medium of industry and that they need to approach video game design critically, thoughtfully, and effectively. Thank you.
what happened. Here, let me show you. I'll show you. Oh, good. Okay. Yes. Please. <laughs> Take it away. The, you love it when the password's on the table. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for these presentations the last day and, and this morning. They've been so inspiring um, for me. I am also really thankful for the organizers um, for inviting me to this. I don't think that I realized that I study speculation and memory until I was invited to this panel. Um, don't worry, I do. I do study that. I do have something to say about that. Uh, but I didn't, I don't think I quite realized that I need to change my, my bio. Um, I hope that this doesn't feel like a presentation about, um, that's set apart as unrelated to all of the other ones that we've, we've seen. Um, I think that it is set apart, um, but I, I think that it also speaks to some of the things that previous presentations have tried to reveal through their art practices or through their pedagogy, power strugg struggles, establishing agencies. Um, and this talk is really about the politics of that, of those practices. Um, most of what I do most of the time is I look at how different political cultures um, normatively construct computing technologies, so how over time different legal systems come to understand different computing systems. I'm particularly interested in how they do that in a, in a way that's both negotiated and in conflict with one another. So um, as Megan said, I have written a book on the right to be forgotten and I'm writing a book on cookies, so the fact that it didn't occur to me that I study speculation and memory is a little silly, um, but that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, today, both of these subjects. So I'm going to start with cookies, which is um, chronologically um, correct for the rest of the world, but it's currently, it's my current project. Um, cookies has this, at its inception, has this really wonderful language about statelessness and persistence and memory. Um, it, it was uh, really an attempt um, after the web was put out in this very limited way in, the, in 1990 uh, for a couple of development groups were working on establishing state, maintaining state, solving for state in a stateless uh, environment. The web is very purposefully designed to be stateless by Tim Berners-Lee. Um, and these people are in conversation with one another on Usenet forums. And so there is this interesting back and forth that's still available. Um, it is just part of the very little bit of memory from that time period that has been preserved. Um, but Lou Montulli, in reflecting in 2013 on cookies um, that he was working it on in 1994 at Netscape for the Mosaic browser, which is the first time that we see cookies, um, he explains, this is, this is the way that he explained the problem as he understood it, and it was really a way about finding um, and establishing some type of memory that limited tracking online, which is certainly not how we think about cookies today as a limitation on tracking. Um, but it's a really interesting form of memory, if you, th if you think about it, um, there were a handful of other proposals for establishing memory. So the way that cookies and the early web are described is always kind of funny. So I'm going to throw out a bunch of different ways that I've heard it described. One of them was that the, the web before cookies or for this type of state maintenance um, was available was like going up to a vending machine. It was a request response system. It doesn't remember you. Just put your money in and it gives you the thing. If you go back up, you can't say, I was just here five minutes ago. I was just like another Reese's Pieces or whatever. Um, but um, what cookies enabled the web to do was to be like a dry cleaner where you would go in and you would get a ticket handed to you and that ticket, the other half of that ticket is held by the dry cleaner. Um, so it's this strange form of memory where uh, essentially a site asks you to hold a thing that they can remember. 
So it doesn't make any sense to you. It's not your memory. Um, it's really just their memory for you. Um, and what happened very, very quickly um, was that as the web was trying to figure out, as, um, as people were trying to figure out how to make money on the web, um, DoubleClick and a couple of other competitors began to use cookies in 1996. So 95 we have, um, the um, Internet Explorer version 2 um, and Netscape 1.2 are, are released with cookies and by 1996 DoubleClick is using cookies for its ad network. It's also when the public finds out about cookies. So the public really never knew about uh, web that didn't have commercial web tracking. Um, and they did not like it. There was, uh, cookies have become this strange lightning rod for how we talk about online privacy in a, this really interesting way because again, this, the structure was set up to be the most privacy preserving. Um, and a lot of these, a lot of this really does kind of come back to Lou Montuli, who was 24 when he was working on this um, at Netscape. Um, but he was asked, the, the decision was his at Netscape at the time to block third party tracking. He says in the end, he made, it was his final decision at the, at the time um, to not uh, block third party trackers as a default. And one of the reasons was that this was like an inevitability. Tracking was gonna happen and cookies at least were visible and they could put mechanisms in place that, so that people could control them. Um, as a note, in 1999, People Magazine um, said that Lou Montuli was the sexiest internet mogul. I, <laughs> um, and this speaks to Megan's um, work, I think on the dot com um, era and the dot com bubble and how much um, these people were kind of celebrities in this moment uh, with his dimpled chin, Dylan McDermott chiseling and newfound fashion sense, the six foot Montuli, then 29, is as hot as his internet IPO. Like people knew what the internet IPO was, the Netscape IPO was huge, it was, you know, jokes on late night TV. Um, and so it was a really interesting moment, especially compared to now when a lot of um, these kind of characters have become villains in the stories that we're trying to retell. Um, so I'm quickly just going to talk a little bit about the political realities of regulating cookies. It's going to be very depressing. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the right to be forgotten, which is also depressing. Um, but then we'll have a panel discussion, right? And we can lift the world back up. Okay. Um, so quickly after people um, were publicly upset about cookies, there was confusion about what cookies were, of course. Um, massive online tracking didn't exist. Numbers on the web weren't in all that high at the time, but they were really, really growing, and there was an um, there was a real need to make people comfortable with the web. And so the third versions of Internet Explorer and Mosaic both allowed users to um, control cookies in different ways. Um, but by 1998, the U.S. government had issued reports from various agencies. These are two of them. Um, this uh, first report over here, I think, is the, this is from a computer science kind of perspective, and it basically kind of explains to the, the public, like, hey, dummies, these don't do anything bad. <laughs> They're not that big of a deal, but if you're really concerned about it, like, just go in and change your browser settings. Um, the FTC had uh, held a couple of workshops and kind of comes to the c same conclusion um, over here that, look, there's a way to control these and, um, and that's how we're gonna manage cookies. So fast forward, 2007, none of this has worked very well. Uh, third party cookies are quite rampant. It's very hard to control or manage cookies. Even if you do figure out how to find your cookie settings or add something to your browser, it's just overridden. Um, a lot of times these are crashing systems that people don't want to um, put the time and effort into like reconfiguring their computer for this. Um, so in 2007, this idea of a do not track standard is put forth. Um, I'll just skip um, to the end. It, it, it 
gained some popularity in government, but in the same way that it's kind of like regulating Facebook has gained popularity in the sense that like Facebook should definitely do something about this. Um, but by uh, 2013, the whole multi-stakeholder effort had fallen apart, um, and this is still true to this day. So if you go, if you're using a Chrome browser and you go to the do not track setting, this is what you'll see. Um, you know, you can click it. If you click more information, um, it says, just so you know, some people do not respect the do not track setting, including Google. So it's um, so none of the major um, none of the major platforms respect the do not track uh, standard. Pinterest does, um, but n no one no one else um, no one else really does, and this effort really really fell apart. Um, but one of the more interesting contrasts is how Europe has dealt with cookies. And this backstory, both of these backstories, really start with digital computing in the 60s. Every country around the world was, had implemented these kind of research efforts to look into how computing was going to change society. The US was a leader in this conversation. And this, very much, this was very much, at least in the West, a global kind of uh, international. They were very aware of what people were doing anywhere that had computers. Um, and Europe, um, it, it were, I was reminded of this when um, Sarah was talking in the keynote yesterday, where she was talking about technology as being recognized as a power in and of itself, something that can be grabbed. And I think that this is, we have some legal examples of that from Europe. In, in the 70s, countries passed laws that um, really the default was that you could not compute personal information unless. So the default was just no, because these were recognized, um, so these systems were recognized as uh, very powerful impacts on not only the individual, but different institutional structures. Um, I have a lot of language, of course, up here because law is, is very wordy, um, but maybe it will point to you to something that, that's interesting. Um, so after these national laws are passed, the 95 Data Protection Directive was passed you know all of this because everybody knows what GDPR is. Um, the General Data Protection Regulation um, now kind of trumps all of this, but it's built on everything in the GDPR is kind of built on this earlier, these earlier recognitions that computing was new. Um, it was recognized as a new, um, a new technology that was or could have significant impacts on the individual. But it was, computers were not heavily used in Europe at the time. They were almost all IBM computers. So in the 70s, IBM had 90, 80% of the computer market in most European countries, and the other 10%, and there was another 10% that were US competitors. So part of this conversation, I think, in variations in political construction comes from who are the players, who are the villains, who are the loved heroes, um, and that gets built into our, into our legal conversation. Um, so, of course, this is why most of us know the GDPR is because we keep seeing it in these horrible, horrible pop-ups. Um, uh, if, if you are in Europe, you go to Europe, they're much worse, but we still see them uh, in the United States. Um, a lot of them just say, by using the website, uh, we're putting cookies, you consent, right, like you consent to putting um, cookies on your computer. You consent to this memory system. And you actually have to click yes in Europe, but in the US, our, our cookie banners are different. Um, we have been collecting these cookie banners and the way that developers talk about them. This is my favorite one. You'll see in the first paragraph there, this is one of the EU's steps towards ruining the internet. Uh, this has actually been a very long uh, story of ruining the internet. Um, but this is politics. Um, the e-privacy regulation which kind of pairs with the GDPR uh, is in the works right now. The European Parliament put in a do not track standard, a do not track standard that would be legally protected. The European Council, their, their languages have to uh, align before anything can pass, um, crossed out every time browser was mentioned. Um, so I, 
I'm not sure where this is where this is going, um, but oddly there may be hope from the U.S. There is a lot of movement around federal data protection law because the California Consumer Privacy Act was passed, um, and companies now don't want to deal with 50 different consumer protection, um, data protection laws, and so they want a federal law that preempts it. Some of these laws have at least an opt-out mechanism um, and opting out of this certain type of memory. At this point, it's quite limited what that really does. Um, but one of the interesting components of it um, is that a number of these have a right to delete while others do not. So you can think of a right to deletion as another way of dealing with this uh, data problem where, of course, we didn't read any of these privacy policies. Of course, we couldn't handle any of this. So a right to delete can be thought of as a really good idea to be able to go back and say, look, I didn't mean to give you any of that. Like, you definitely shouldn't have any of that data. I want you to delete it. Um, and so much of the um, internet is built around these privacy policies, and we, at least for a couple of years, wanted to think that these privacy policies were really well thought out and that people adhered to them and that users could understand what they were and then make a choice. This very quickly became like a ridiculous notion. Um, but if you are a startup, you can still go to one of these privacy policy generators and just throw in your, um, your company's name and address and it just spits out a privacy policy that you can put on your, on your website. Um, so it's, it's not just a, a, that users don't see and read them. Um, they aren't always taken that seriously uh, by the people that have your data. So this is just one piece of the right to be forgotten, though. This is just one type of memory. It's kind of data that's passively created uh, that's very hard for a user to manage or understand where it's going to go. I mean, it's virtually impossible to figure out where it's going to go to speculate about what might be done with it. Um, the other piece of online memory is this content that we all put out into the world and the right to be forgotten in Europe. Um, and I should mention that if you're American, you don't have a right to delete. That's a, that's a European thing. Don't, don't go trying to exercise that. Um, the, the right to be forgotten is packaged within the same article in the GDPR. Um, and this is about content um, that you or someone else has put um, into the world about you. And I love this um, story as an example of memory and speculation. Uh, this uh, woman here is a Canadian theater prof um, teacher. She teaches at an all-boys high school in Canada. And she was fired when this kind of like soft core porn from the 70s was digitized and put online. And her students, of course, found it. And she was fired. And the, the school said that um, that that her um, videos, her adult video was just that, that it needed to remain in an adult context. Um, and so this idea that people can make choices and not need this kind of retroactive ability to um, delete data that may have an impact on their life is really funny when you think about this woman who was like supposed to predict web 2.0 in the 70s like that seems like a lot of speculation given that Lou Montulli is like I'll just put cookies in place and everything will be fine right um, so these different types of speculation and these different types of burdens and expectations that we put into our governance systems can be really problematic. And we have some pretty good research on what users are and are not capable of. Um, but the right to be forgotten is constructed, one of the ways that it's distinct from cookies is that it has this shared construction between the EU and the US. And I think that this PSA that showed on the um, Disney Channel is the best way to describe how the European Union and the US legislators understand this problem. They watched this, I assume. Hey Phineas, what you doing? Hey Isabella, you know how a lot of kids go online, right? Well, to help keep them safe, Ferb and I decided to laser inscribe on a meteor our very own Cyberspace Rules of the Road. Mom, Phineas and Ferb are making a public service announcement. Be careful what you put online. It never goes away, ever. 
Time is fleeting, but the internet is forever. And you never know who's gonna see it. There's no way I'm letting this baby out of my sight. Hello, children. I'll take that. So that's really all you need to see, but that's what, um, so kids that watch the Disney Channel see this over and over again. The internet is forever, yeah, and it makes you have this scared, terrified face. Um, yeah, the internet is forever, um, and that who knows who's going to see this information. And I'm looking at Megan and thinking that's got to be like a comical, the internet is forever. I mean, if you're trying to do historical work on the internet, you're like, are you kidding? Like, uh, what do you think I get paid to do? Uh, the, the differences, though, that we see come when that construction of the technology is filtered into these political systems. So these are just a couple of differences that we see. I want to just highlight the bottom two categories. So these numbers I got yesterday um, from Google's transparency report. So Google lost this case in 2014 on the right to be forgotten, and it has to edit its search results um, based on requests from the European Union. So, so far they've gotten 800,977 requests to remove over 3 million URLs and have removed um, about 1.2 million so far. So you have this um, system of removal. We don't really know anything about it. It happens all internally to Google. There's no oversight. Um, it's, there's some coordination with European DPAs, but um, it's quite a disappointing way to establish a right if you really care about it. Um, meanwhile, in the United States, we have this long-held legal maxim that is equity will not enjoin a libel, uh, which means that we will not remove um, fa libelous information. So even false information or lies will not be dealt with by uh, any type of action. They will be financially uh, dealt with. Uh, this is, meaning that your remedies is never going to be like Google has to do something or a newspaper has to do something or your friend's blog has to come, come down, that any damages will be financial. So we are quite a ways away from any type of right to be forgotten. Right to be forgotten is about truthful information. We can't even get lies removed from things. So truthful information is going to be a little bit trickier. Um, now, the last thing I just want to mention really quickly um, is, uh, is Hello Barbie. Um, so when we think about memory and speculation and we think about um, the future of memory in smart environments, um, we can think about how Hello Barbie interacts with those two uh, pieces of governance that we just talked about, um, whether it's a right to delete or a, a right to be forgotten, whether or not Hello Barbie is sophisticated enough or willing uh, to uh, provide those types of uh, memories. She's, so spoiler alert, she is not. We tested this. Uh, we talked to Hello Barbie to try to get her to keep our secrets. Uh, she does not ignore, she does not understand any type of language um, that has to do with keeping things uh, private. Uh, she just keeps asking questions. She just keeps going. But it, and it's strange. So you can't say. Barbie, who do you tell this? Barbie, are you recording this? Barbie, yes, I'll tell you this, but you won't tell anybody, right? She just keeps asking you about pageants and what kind of food you like or what your middle name is um, and where you live. Um, but, but you can't quite get her to engage, you can't quite engage with her memory system. Um, and so this is um, current types of speculation on memory, I think will look a lot more like Hello Barbie than they will cookies. Thank you very much. I know we don't have too much time uh, for questions, but hopefully we can. Um, can we take a couple of the oh, next ones? Okay. Um, so much for this. This is fascinating. I, I, um, I wanted to start us off with a question, if that was okay. I'm, I'm very interested in uh, thinking about this. Oh. Can you hear me? Hello? Is it on? Oh. Hello? 
Hello? Okay. Got it. Um, so I'm really interested in this precarious problem, right? Like on, on one hand, I was interested, Tiffany, in what you were saying, thinking about speculation as pedagogy, and then thinking about the future, our students, and as they go on. But this, this problem, I guess, in between, on one hand, you know, digital confounds the way we think about preservation. Who's going to, you know, play the, it's not just like, oh, here's the books in the library, right? It's like, here's the platform, and here's the plug, and here's the, you know, the electrical circuit system that we need, like, but all of these pieces, software, hardware, all of this, in order to maintain it. And so the question is, who, who how are we going to preserve these things so that, you know, historians and artists in the future can tell these histories and do these things, and at the same time, that the digital is very, very hard to preserve. It's, you know, how often we hear this story or, you know, students that, oh, once that picture of the keg stand, you're tagged in that on Facebook, you will never get that back. It will be there forever, <laughs> right? So there's these like two opposite logics at the same time. And I'm, I just wanted to sort of ask more about that or, or if anyone has thoughts on how in your own practice, thinking video games mm -hmm. or internet installation work, mm -hmm you've thought about the question of preservation there. Yeah, I, I think about it um, even a step back yet, as in, I mean, going back to the pedagogical methods, that idea of um, actually imparting upon students, imparting upon anybody, really, that what is it that they, um, th that they have an imperative to actually shape history. Um, that, like, what is it that they actually, um, how do they shape history in their own minds and what do they value? And the value system, I'm not going to say that the value system will make that, you know, will, will make that imperative, but it'll at least shape what is important. So this, you know, this early history of computer art is something that we just, we have not saved. Or this idea, I mean, Case in point, um, so I met um, somebody who's in informatics, and uh, he was he was taking it upon himself to um, archive uh, Homestar Runner videos, like flash videos. Yeah, I mean, I think he's doing God's work. Um, so, like early internet flash videos are, you know, you can't even get flash to work on your computer anymore. So, how do you? how do you find a way to archive that? And same way with like, with ROMs, but, but it's also to shape the understanding of what that thing is, that like Flash or mac Macromedia Director, some of these early interactive um, programs, there's really no real good way of representing it except as some sort of emulation. Um, and that, it, it really is on the users to find like what is important and taking the initiative to create that and archive that content. But also there, there is a lot of people who talk about how they just don't feel that everything needs to be saved. So, um, I mean, along with the right to be forgotten, but even just this idea that it's like, okay, all of these Reddit message boards, do these really need to be archived and saved? That, that's, and that is a question that's coming up more and more instead of just aggregating all this data, too. So, I mean, this isn't necessarily saying any sort of, I don't have any solutions for how this is done, because it seems more like a crowdsourcing sort of idea right now, which they're, they're um, it's institutions like these that have these informatics library systems that are actually doing the work of archiving some of these things. But then it, it, it comes down to what they find important to archive. I think I'll sort of look at it how uh, institutions try to preserve some of this media, or art uh, or electronic media, or how you try to sell it, which becomes very problematic. Uh, let's look at software art, where to actually sell it, um, you know, based on the computer you're working on, goes very quickly out of date. So a lot of models then sort of say it's actually not the object itself, but let's say algorithm, or mm -hmm. right. So it's the code or kind of the instructional system, which then can be. Uh, updated from basic to C++ to, to um, you know, whatever the latest flavor might be. Uh, similarly, like in electronic art, similar issues of r r r kind of um, risen up, like Dan Flavin, for example, used to just buy his tube lights from the local hardware store. Now to maintain a, 
a Dan Flavin? Is it just the tube light from your hardware store, which now is not even fluorescent, is LED? Or do you have to preserve those Sylvan lights who are still manufacturing them purely for Dan Flavin <laughs> preservation? Uh, so it is, it's a kind of critical thing. And also, what is the model? So if I can't sell my work, do I have a software lead, uh, kind of agreement that every five years you'll up pay me to update? Uh, my software goes obsolete very quickly. Every time APIs don't work, uh, things like that. So, so. Well, it's interesting, I, and I notice this with most of the artwork that we've seen here, that it's, it's recorded, it's preserved through video of you recording somebody interacting with the piece, which is... I mean, I don't know, but incredibly valuable. You know, when you think about what's going to be there to, to see how it works, just to be able to see, well, what did it look like is the first thing that's difficult to do, so that's interesting. The, the other kind of thought, just a quick one on that is, you know, they're preserved at 320 by 240, yeah. which looked big <laughs> at one point, and now <laughs> we're getting postage, <laughs> postage stamp kind of remembrances, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I would love this to be a larger conversation about what we keep and what goes. Like, um, libraries have preservation policies with privacy built into them. You know, these go hand in hand. Um, and so I think of the preservation piece as much more pressing than the privacy piece because I think that model's already built into the preservation efforts or it can easily be... Um, applied to it, uh, I don't. I, I don't know how you solve getting some. Getting you know, I think of this as like a Library of Congress effort, a governmental effort. Fifty percent of um, of links in Supreme Court cases go nowhere. Like that's a government record that's you know that doesn't exist. That should not be the case in a specific. Um, environment where you're legally required to have access to certain types of information if a government website is gone that doesn't seem that seems like we're really not paying enough attention to this problem and I sort of feel like a hey while we're preserving government websites yeah. <laughs> let's preserve uh, you know a number of websites and, and have a real policy and a real emphasis around this but again political willingness well, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, policies are, I, um, as you're talking about this, a, a different policy that, that I encountered, I was um, doing my, my book through NYU, and they had recently adopted a new policy, which is if you have a URL in your, if you're citing something, um, that's a URL, you should eliminate everything after the first, you know, something, something, dot com, and just leave off the rest. And their rationale was, oh, the links will be dead anyway. And I was like, yeah, but that information actually contains a ton of clues about what this was, how you might be able to find it, even like, you know, using the Wayback Machine in order to dig it up. And it, for them, it was, no, our policy is unless it's a YouTube video. And that was it. And it was like, why does YouTube I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it, oh, it, it, it struck me as people make up, I think people make up policies depending on what you've encountered. And they've encountered YouTube vis videos, so they made a policy about it, but they hadn't encountered people, you know, that are citing deep links within the Wayback Machine. It is an ugly line. So I can just imagine how sad the editors were, where they're like, please get rid of all those question marks and things. And, no, I need them all. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, other people, questions? Thanks. Yeah. So other people have made that connection, um, and I actually, I guess my efforts on that front have been to poke at it a little bit, especially now. I, we currently live in a moment where nobody trusts anybody, so it's actually kind of handy, like across Europe and the U.S. There's been uh, a little bit of um, movement on that, and different, different countries have different relationships to their governments. France is different than Germany, of course. Um, but the, um, 
the commingling of government data with corporate data and transnational data has really challenged that idea that there's trust to be had in one of these entities um, and was I think a real motivating factor in the GDPR trying to resituate the landscape um, on, on how this was all arranged and it applies across the board. Any other questions? Lisa? Oh, I have a question about um, the right to be deleted. Um, and the term that both Facebook and um, Twitter have gone towards saying we're not going to collect likenesses. You know, we're going to take away that way of measuring or signaling engagement because it's, it's, it's bad. It's the economy that you don't like and there's the popularity contest, but it also serves for this information. So I was thinking about option speech around putting in your identity and seeing where you stand. Like, what if you could delete your um, parts of your online identity? What would happen with that speech? Uh, so two things. Uh, one, uh, most people complain because the name on your credit card has usually an initial or so they'd often be like, that, but that's not, that's not the name I actually right. use, yeah. right. especially when they didn't do well. When they did well, they yeah. owned up that's to me. it. That's me. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the piece would start, you know, you would not show up. You would stop existing uh, to, to, to some degree. So yeah, street cred, right? I didn't show up. <laughs> Off the grid. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, I don't have a specific question, but I was wondering if you could sort of talk about that neutrality. Do you think that that will be ongoing or over? Or some of the impact of this kind of talk? So the question's about net neutrality. Anybody could that's you, Meg. <laughs> yes, you know, I've, I mean, lots of people have lots to say about about this. I, um, uh, so, it's uh, dead for the moment. Um, all of this is a little dead for the moment. I think that the presidential campaigns are going to be really interesting. I, um, the Warrens break up Facebook posters are fascinating to me. A lot of times, this is these tech debates, including the net neutrality, don't have a clear um, political alignment, but we're seeing some strange movement on that. So the, you know, Silicon Valley is now liberal, right? Like it's got liberal rules, it's built by liberal people. Silicon Valley itself is still, is still politically like neoliberal, like it still doesn't want to be regulated, but also is like now willing to be regulated in certain ways. Um, but it, I think that wh who comes in power, the Democrats have been very willing to put net neutrality rules in place um, and the Republicans have not. And it's actually a really interesting example of speculation and memory because both of them say that they want to take the internet back to wit back to when it was in its glory days. And it's so funny because you're like, wait a minute, how was it in it? Wait, first, when was its glory days? Um, and then how do we think about the, the players and who had access to what and what they're trying to achieve by setting up these, um, these rules for like a future internet that is the old internet? Um, so I don't think you'll see any movement on it, but if the, if the Democrats um, do, um, gain, you know, political power in, in 2020, I think you'll absolutely see it again on the agenda. I think you'll also see um, privacy rules on, um, at the FCC come back into question. Um, in talking about the, the next presidential election um, in terms of net neutrality, I mean, I hope you all know that Beto O'Rourke is supposedly a hacker. Do you, does anybody know that he was part of the collective, the, the um, decapitated cow, like the the proto lalsec uh, proto anonymous group. Although, I, from what I hear, all that he did wasn't he like Mystic Warrior or something? Yeah, that, that was his handle, and all he really did was he like he uploaded sort of like weird fiction. But um, 
But like the, they make the point that he has um, a a younger person's understanding of the internet, and so this that could be. I mean, uh, it could be a l marker of a, a larger shift where if you get a larger, younger uh, slew of candidates, that they have some more understanding of being citizens who've been on the internet at least since college. Like for example. Yeah, I think that there is that is really an, a really interesting possibility because. When you're young, you don't realize that YouTube's going to die someday. Like, Facebook's not going to be a forever thing. Like, that reality is hard to even contemplate. And I think, you you know, you get, like, rules about, like, well, obviously Google's going to be around, so you can keep the YouTube video in your citations. But these other things, like, they're going to be gone. Um, and so this idea, I don't know how younger politicians understand like breakup model break up breaking up of techs other people like lived through breaking up big tech companies mm -hmm. um and so that could be like an interesting component power component here i think unless facebook is broken up um as good morning america <laughs> would have us believe yeah uh yeah question back That's a hard one to say. I mean, he makes a very compelling point, but is that is does that have enough power to hold water? I don't even know. I, the breakup, um, so the vision, uh, Chris Hughes' breakup um, is to break up Facebook from WhatsApp and Instagram. So Facebook's still Facebook, and there, I think, is the argument that like, that's not really, doesn't really do all that much, because you know, that entity, entity is still its monster, monster of a social, not, not monster in that sense, but um, I don't know, however you feel about that. But uh, yeah, so I, I think it's one unlikely and antitrust policy in America would have to shift dramatically for that to happen, mm -hmm. which would take a very long time. Um, and even if it did break it up, it would have to be I think a different type of breakup model to achieve what it's trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we could see examples in other telecommunication monopolies that were brought up, broken up, but have now, yeah. you know, become <laughs> monopolies again, else. right? Yeah. Yeah. And have become monopolies again. Right. So again, until public policy changes, it's more of the same. Is there one Uh, yeah, so the, the, the GDPR is um, both, is both, uh, it's this mix, right? It's this mix of time and places. Um, it has a slew of individual rights, again, based on rights that Europeans already had. Um, and one of the criticisms was that that placed the burden, placed a significant burden on the individual to, like, make this all right. Not to use rights too many times, but um, the GDPR now, because it changed the definition of consent, it has to be real consent, um, it has a lot of, um, and the old versions had uh, some of these too, but there are obligations, there are obligations on data controllers, whether they're companies or not, uh, regardless of individual rights. 
Uh, here in the U.S., um, we are still kind of stuck in, not surprisingly, in a, in a leo, neoliberal mindset um, that maybe there is some individual rights combination with other market forces that can maybe achieve something, but also this new, again, conversation about antitrust as a possibility, which is, of course, not based on neoliberal um, ideas, but... Yeah, the GDPR is an attempt to be post-neoliberal, whatever, or something. Uh, and, and here in the U.S., I think we're really trying to get out of this innovation rhetoric from the 2000s. Probably another way to think about it is just, um, you know, these are different instantiations. So I think in the 80s when the U.N. tried to create the Charter of Human Rights, uh, the sort of communist bloc sort of said everyone has a right to a home or... Uh, education and the U.S. or the kind of Western said everyone has right to free speech. Now, what is the right right? <laughs> uh, so, if you look at the internet in China, it's a very different understanding, a different instantiation, of different parameters versus, let's say, Europe and, and America. So, again, I think there are rights given and rights taken away in all of them, um, and maybe that's the sort of new model. But there are different instantiations, and in, in a, another speculative world, maybe rather than a kind of global, we start thinking about much more localized mesh networks that allow us to bypass some of this stuff as well. And yeah, or something like that. You know, just that alternatives will come out. I don't know what, I mean, we'd have to save our planet first, but. Uh, <laughs> just to bring it down. Yeah, yeah, bring everybody down. Well, please uh, join me in thanking our panelists. At